Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Feeling Seen, the podcast that talks about the movies that make us feel seen. And my co-host today is one of those very special guests that we get to have every once in a while. I've wanted to have her on for ages now. Uh, she is a friend and a collaborator and a co-worker, a colleague, a creative force and partner. Um, you might have heard me discussing the movie she executive produced and directed on and wrote for that I was also a producer on. Give me an A. It's come up a number of times in this very podcast. And maybe... You are familiar with the Fatal Collective, and you have seen shorts that she's made, such as Beauty Juice. Natasha Holovy, what do the people need to know about you? Oh, my gosh. Um, that was, like, the best introduction. Would you please join me in all <laughs> my endeavors in life? Like, all of it. Grocery shopping. Uh, yeah, that's at the checkout point. We do that. <laughs> like, hold on a minute. Before she puts that card in the reader. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, anything else anybody should know, like... We'll get into that, I guess. <laughs> yes, we will get. And, you know, I, I think it's important to to shout out. Uh, we come together now with the resolution of the, uh, you know, looks like the resolution of the writer strike. That is fantastic news. And now solidarity with SAG. SAG needs their deal as well, their fair deal. So we have good news and we have continuing news on that front. I just want to get that out of the way. Oh, because you have been so out there picketing true. like a maniac. Yes. I mean, I haven't been in in. In a town, not not in town, in a town, in a city that has um, picket lines as much as I would have liked to have been this summer. But mm-hmm. when I've been in Los Angeles or New York, I've definitely gone out because, you know, the the strike, the writer strike, the actor strike, it's not just sort of like insular. You know, it's not just the entertainment industry. It's so indicative no. of an overall problem that we have in our society. And I think... You know, the entertainment industry sort of has this history of being an example of like bad shit that's like going on in our society. And like, you know, we had like the Me Too movement. And like, I talked to my mom about that recently. And she was like, oh, this strike is kind of like your Me Too movement. And I was like, mom, the Me Too movement was the entertainment industry. And she was like, it was. And I was like, that's the best, actually, because from her point of view, it's a part of like the fabric of our society, which is true. It is now. And it's accessible to everyone. And I hope that the the strike sort of has something similar to that going on in that people recognize that the gap between those that have a lot and those that have a little keeps getting bigger and bigger. The middle class is just disappearing, mm-hmm. um, you know, and that's not unrelated to, you know, when a majority of the people in a country want something that doesn't happen. <coughs> abortion rights. Yeah. So, you know, I think um, it's all part of like something in our zeitgeist that's like really, really bigger than we even think it is. Um, Also, I'd love to get back to work as an actor. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And people just like people just should be able to work like the that's been such an insane part of watching this play out that like hearing, you know, hearing some of the commentary from very, very rich people in high play studio positions like it wasn't like surprising to hear the content of their thoughts, but it's still shocking to hear Things like, you know, well, the writer, the demands that the writers are making are just unreasonable. It's like, um, Bob, hey, Bob's like you're you're pulling like dozens of millions of dollars a year in your bonuses past your like heavy salaries. But like what you're saying is you want these people's jobs to be hobbies and that they should be happy to feel that way. It's insane to hear people be like a whole career should just be a side gig you do for the love of the game. Truly, truly. Uh, the navigating even that, uh, you know, the logistics of it, it being a side game is like, oh my <laughs> gosh, how do you do that and survive? And, you know, like we're all kind of tired of like taking turns sleeping on each other's couches. Yeah. You know, like that's that's rough. We're all grown ups. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, one of the things that's so interesting, like when you bring up like Bob and like all, all I mean, he's really... He's, I mean, whatever, we're all glad that he helped make the resolution because now we're on the positive side of things. And I want to like, I don't want to get too like bogged down and being unhappy about things. Of course. But it is pretty interesting to see all the demands were met, um, mostly from from, uh, what the Writers Guild was asking. And, you know, we were kind of just playing this game all along by, Mm -hmm. you know, the people who pull all the puppet strings. And they knew exactly when they needed the strike to end. They knew when they needed to go back into production. They paid Mm. people to do the math on that while we all sat around and didn't know. And Mm. while like, 
it was really important for us to all gather together and be on the picket line. I think it was more important for us to be there together than it was for them to see us there because they always mm. knew the math. They knew they were going to have to cave at a certain point. And mm. the fact that they made the deal the way they did shows that. And mm-hmm. so I'm really happy, obviously, that we have a deal, but it feels like such a bummer to sort of be played. Um, sure. You know, and I think, you know, that's sort of where we're at right now in society. And we kind of got played and now we get to go back to work. <laughs> you know what? I think this is actually a relevant. I'm going to call this a relevant segue into the character discussion that we're going to have today, because a choice for the 90s girls, the girls who grew up not feeling like they necessarily fit um, as perhaps a bit of a square peg, being honored by one of the the great era icons of the alt-girl phase of the 90s, you have presented to us Wednesday Adams <laughs> as your character today. Yes. The Bermuda Triangle is a very strange and mysterious place. You'd be surprised at all the things you don't know. She certainly would. Wednesday adores the Bermuda Triangle. She studies it. Death at sea. She's hooked. Ask me anything. I think Wednesday Adams would have a similar feeling to what you're feeling right now about, like, how this, like, labor revolution is progressing for people. But how old were you when you first encountered the Wednesday Adams? Um, I mean, okay, so, like, the the Wednesday Adams that I love... Mm-hmm. Well, I love our new Wednesday Adams, first of all. So let me just yes, say, new Wednesday. It, Jenna Ortega shouts out. Oof. The only thing about Jenna Ortega's Wednesday Adams that I can't handle is that I feel like if I was seeing her as a young woman right now, I'd be like, she's way too cool for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I would, I, I would see Jenna Ortega and be like, wow, no one must like her. I'd I mean, be like, who does? Does she have everyone's? Is she fighting off people's texts every day? <laughs> like, no, I love her as Wednesday. Adams. Oh. I love that character so much. I love the way she's playing it. Um, okay, but Christina Ricci. Um, she was my Wednesday and Mm -hmm. I was probably around the same age as that Wednesday Adam. Mm -hmm. So like, I think that we're probably around the same age. Um, so that Wednesday was always like really me from an age perspective. So I guess Mm. that means I was probably 10 when I, she was 10. Yeah, she was 10. It was that 19, I mean, I was born in 1982. So yeah, maybe I was like nine or 10 when I when mm-hmm. I saw, you know, I don't know if, if I probably didn't see it in a theater. Or I don't know. Everything works so different then. I don't know. <laughs> I probably, yeah. Probably saw it on TV. I don't know. But like <laughs> a year later because it didn't stream like the next day. Exactly. Um. Yeah. So sh- what a cool character and what a cool evolution from like the first movie to the second movie. Uh, yes. I was going to ask you if you at like because if you're if you are that character at that age at that same time, did you feel like you were sort of growing along with Wednesday? Like when you saw her from one to values, did that feel like a oh, man, like this person's life has moved like my life? Yeah. So Wednesday Adams um, like came to me <laughs> mm-hmm. Um And I say that because like in the first movie, you know, she's pretty, she's just kind of like weird, awkward, has her two little braids and Mm. um, has her little like bit sentences here and there and (laughs) is kind of just like this creepy, awkward, weird girl. Mm -hmm. And when I was in, I guess this would have been like fourth grade, maybe fifth grade, the older boys in the grade above me i used to wear my hair in like two braids all the Mm. time because i loved braiding hair i love braiding (laughs) other people's hair even like well into high school i uh, on the like uh track team i would braid everybody's hair before races like (laughs) there was always a girl who braided everyone's hair yes so like calming i love it i would braid all my barbies and i would french braid all my dolls and like learn how to do it myself and so I wore my hair in braids a lot. Also really convenient, get your hair out of your face. Uh, and the boys in the class above me, every time I would walk by for, I don't know, to me, it feels like years, but I'm sure it was like maybe a week. Yeah. They would go, da na 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 Really? And <laughs> I was so, like, it, it happened so often and it was so weird. Um, and it makes you feel like shit. You're like a young child and you're being made fun of. Of course, now mm. I recognize that part of that as like 
fifth graders and sixth graders and fourth graders. Like that's some sort of weird version of like flirting. Yeah. Like, you could flirt with me straight to my face and I would think you were making fun of me. So if you're making fun of me and flirting, like I definitely <laughs> think you're making fun of me. So finally, I mean, it took me a while to figure out how to respond to these animals. And uh, when they would do it, I'd walk by and they go, da na na na. I would go. Yes. And so, you gotta, you gotta do it. <laughs> I finally found my little way to be like, I don't care. But of course I did care. And it really like hurt my feelings because mm -hmm. they were trying to call me something negative. But then a few years later, mm -hmm. Wednesday Adams comes back. Yeah. Throws it all up in their face and is a badass little chick to <laughs> go from feeling like that character was like a part of me because other people put it on me. Mm. To um and feeling like, oh, I'm weird and awkward to feeling like, oh, now I'm like empowered and strong. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a weird, cool thing to be like adjacent to all the other things going on, obviously, in a kid's life. I think that's actually a really fantastic point, because like that. I mean, that is kind of what when you're young, like the, it was the uniqueness about you that was the thing you got called out for. And not because people are like, hey, that's cool of you, but because yeah. they were like, that's the thing that makes you different from me. So fuck you. And whether it's flirtatious or it's making fun of you. So that's like that's such a I feel like that's putting the nail on the head of such like the experience of having to grow up and realize like, oh, the thing I got called out for is actually like a special thing about me. Yes. Wednesday. Look at all the other children, their freckles, their bright little eyes, their eager, friendly smiles. Help them. Hi, I'm Amanda Buckman. Why are you dressed like that? Like what? Like you're going to a funeral. Why are you dressed like somebody died? Wait. I, I had the I had the incredible honor of getting to interview Christina Ricci for uh, Jesse Thorne's Bullseye, and Ugh. we talked about like I asked her about like being I was like you know what was the difference that you felt then to now in terms of like was there more of a permissiveness to be unique and interesting and and as you know as she was sort of labeled in the two, specific by people who didn't want to cast her in things she was euphemistically I guess called specific and not given roles but um she talked about how like she was like listen the 90s weren't like as bucking the trends as you think they were she was like i was like an alt girl kind of thing but that was also a type yes and that totally. was also what was marketable and that was what you could package so yes chloe savigny melanie linsky natasha Lynch, like yes these are all like incredible oddity girls but there was also a cultural cachet to that at the time too that made it a profitable enterprise for the people shaping those images to be that way too so that's such a tension that uh, existed at that time totally and then i don't know to like bring it full circle like great that that's marketable great that like the odd the oddball the odd girl could mm -hmm. be like marketable so then when you like bring it all back around it's like uh what am i even fighting about anyway <laughs> great. <laughs> great the odd girl was marketable and lots of people went and saw a movie with her in it and and loved what she did this is great mm -hmm. news <laughs> yeah yeah it's it, it, it's good it's great news and it makes a lot of money and it's like a, a cultural staple of, of that time that, uh, you know, millennials, early Gen Xers bring with us. And I was wondering, like, what did you register then about Wednesday nuking a Thanksgiving pageant uh, and like going after the white oppressors versus what do you like when you see that now? Are you like, shit, I was really watching this as a kid being like, that looks like fun. And now I'm like, wow, this is really happening in this movie. Damn. Welcome to our table, our new primitive friends. Thank you, Sarah Miller. You're the most beautiful person I've ever seen. Your hair is the color of the sun. Your skin is like fresh milk. And everyone loves you. Stop! Sit. Wait. What? We cannot break bread with you. Huh? Becky, what's going on? Wednesday! You have taken the land which is rightfully ours. Years from now, my people will be forced to live in mobile homes, on reservations. Your people will wear cardigans and drink highballs. Yeah, I mean, okay, so I feel like as I get older, I have such like, uh, I revisit my perspective on like the United States and American history and all mm. that over and over and over again. But like, I was, I was born and raised in California and I went to school in fourth grade while this movie came out. Um, at a school that was a part of one of the California missions. 
My mm. school was built on top of a native burial. Oh, God. It's since they've like done a lot of writing of that. There's like a museum next door and like everything is like, um, you know, now even even then the museum was next door and there were, you know, it was just co- sort of like uh, it's complicated. History is complicated. But yeah. um, sort of like the point there, <laughs> the point that I'm trying to get to is I had actually a really strong awareness. We all had a really strong awareness at that particular location about the fact that like in this case, very different from like what's going on, like Thanksgiving style with like ye pilgrims at all Mm -hmm. Um, in the United States or in California, the Spaniards were coming up the coast and they were building a mission like a horse ride apart. And they were definitely exploiting the local population of natives. In this case, in um, where I grew up in Ventura was the Chumash. So we mm-hmm. actually, because the school was built the way it was built, because the, we were right next to this mission, even at a young mm-hmm. age, we had a really, like we were taught in that school about sort of the travesty of- uh, Oh, that's a- that's really good to know. Yeah, of like what, like how, and in fourth grade specifically, which is what I'm talking about, you have your mission project where you like build a mission and you really study how all the California missions were built in the Spaniards, basically their conquest of yeah. of California while they were trying to beat the Russians from coming down from Alaska. Like, I mean, the whole thing's crazy. Meanwhile, the rest of the United States is doing their thing. Uh, yeah. You know, so like, It just happened that where I was, I had a really strong awareness of the fact that like we'd kind of like I lived in a place that had exploited a native population. I think when I like now study the rest of the United States in so much more detail and I spent time living in some of the areas um, where like natives were really pushed out, like um, Mm -hmm. in uh, Atlanta, where I've spent a lot of time because of film and TV. Um, and following like the Tiro trails back to California, like in a car um, and Mm -hmm. learning a lot more about some of what really went down on that side of the United States. It's, it's like real, real shitty. So I I always knew it was pretty bad. I think like what happened in California was like very different from what happened, um, but was still very much exploitation, but like Mm -hmm. stuff that went down on the other side of the country was like real bad. And uh, yeah, so when I saw that scene, this is all to say, I was like, yeah, yeah. of course. Like, yeah, so you clocked at the time that you were like, yes, Wednesday is in step with the accurate, like, historic, like, her reaction to this, like, versus, like, yeah, I'm watching it as a kid and not having, like, we didn't talk about that. It can be elementary schools. So that is, that is a fascinating. I would say advantage to the way you grew up to be able to actually clock the perspective of that scene when it happened. I really was like, everyone's on board with this. It kind of didn't ever occur to me. And by then I was like in whatever, sixth or seventh grade or something. And I'd been at the school the entire time and like was really embedded in this like idea of like, yeah, there were some very disrespectful, bad, exploitative things that happen. And we have to be like cognizant and aware. And like, you know, now I have, I think maybe pushing past that like reparations not such a bad call everyone like yeah yeah we should look at this um you know but like you know at the time I was definitely like that was bad stuff and so I kind of didn't sometimes I like rewind and I'm like oh I didn't really realize how important that scene was for for everyone like that was like really radical and really important for so many people to see especially because that's a family movie yeah young people are watching that and processing it through stories. So it's like really sinking in deep instead of just being told like through history class. Mm -hmm. That's so like there could, that's one of the most important ways you could convey that information is with that scene, like for our entire population and anybody else who was like, it's just like, wow, what an important historic moment for a cinema. The gods of my tribe have spoken. They have said, do not trust the pilgrims, especially. Sarah Miller. Gary, she's changing the words. And for all these reasons, I've decided to scalp you and burn your village to the ground. You are someone of many careers. You are someone who has lived many lives. You have been a you've been a boulderer, a rock climber, a 
but were you a biologist, was, you, an yeah. architect? Yeah. <laughs> um, like all of that, all of that came before your career in the arts and entertainment. So when did you start realizing that you had a drive toward this? And was it just like an interest of like, I want to be a performer, I want to be in the arts or, or was, and because you're very, I feel like you're very thoughtful and you're a very conscientious person. Like what, when did you start sort of like registering like, damn, this is, like can be kind of important if you let it be as well, like making movies and stuff. Well, I think I, like many people have a problem of like listening to my gut. <laughs> mm. um, and so like, I always was sort of, you know, like when I was in school as a kid, I was making like, if we, if we had to write a play for a class, I would film it on like the like video camera and then, mm do like in camera editing and like bring it in and drag the the TV down the hallway yeah. on the wheels <laughs> with it strapped yes. to the big cart yes. yeah and like stick the, the the like VHS in um so I always kind of was doing that I went to school at UC Davis for biology but I left with a theater degree and a biology degree <laughs> sounds sounds like you I was like oh no I'm just doing this thing over here and like the arts were always like, oh, really? Because it looks like you're actually over here with us. <laughs> so I think I was just sort of denying the truth for a long time, but I love all the things I did and they can, they are part of who I am. And, you know, being out in the world, like as a climber and as a biologist and, and, you know, I was really literally out in the world as a biologist. I worked for the forest mm -hmm. service and for the park service doing um, like work outdoors, like, uh, related to fire ecology research at the time and, um, looking at new growth with plants. And I mean, I was like, we'd be out in the back country for 14 days. So just being in weird places and seeing people live differently, I think really in my early twenties, especially probably helped me open up a mm -hmm. lot to just all the differences in the world. And that helps me when I travel and everything, you know, um, I like slept on the ground and like shat in a hole all the time, you know? Yeah. So like you kind of go back to your base, like, oh, this is being a human. Like I'm tired. I sleep. And like, mm -hmm. you know, I have bodily functions and I'm outdoors and there's no like running water anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of like, I don't know. That's a really weird answer to your question. Um, but, you know, that was always a part of my life. And so I like sort of tacked on this like openness and always still had sort of theater. I was doing theater when I was in, I was living in Colorado or I moved to go climb and then I mm -hmm. laid biology into working in sustainable architecture and like <laughs> yeah. you do. And um, so it was always in there. And I, I came back to California for family stuff and um, the way you do like that same kind of performing in mm -hmm. California and Los Angeles mm -hmm that you would do in Colorado isn't that you go do like a theater project with a cool, weird experimental theater. It's that you get cast in something and then all of a sudden you're in a film and that's how that kind of went down. Um, and I always love like the technology of, of like filmmaking and the pieces and the editing. And I had always kind of done that in little pieces here and there in my life. So it was always there. I just mm -hmm. was like ignoring it. And then I was like, okay, fine, mm -hmm. you can take over now. So that's kind of the fuzzy version <laughs> that included me telling you that I shat in holes sometimes. <laughs> no, I, I'm a, I, that really under, that to me underscores, I really like um, Hollywood as a second career. I, that's mm -hmm. like, the, currently, like, that's my life as well. And But so like, maybe perhaps I have a bias toward that. But like, I just, you know, this is, this is an industry that takes so much, like, ability to weather rejection and I would say patience, but I would also just say, like, that sounds so graceful. It also just takes an incredible ability to sit with impatience. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm I'm not always fucking patient, but I sure as shit am still doing. I'm still going to push. But there's what you don't get from those years, perhaps from those, like, early 20s onward, the beginning of your career that you spend, like, plowing that filmmaking path forward. You're telling stories to and of the world, to have lived of the world and a part of it in different places and done different things, I think is has a valuable aspect of it when you go and pursue a career in the arts to be like, and this is the prep work that I've been doing adjacent to this that has prepared me for embarking on this new career. And I think that's I think that's a nice thing. I love that. I love everything you just said. I think I have so much respect for young filmmakers 
Um, and it's so weird, you know, first of all, in, in Hollywood in general, a lot of young female filmmakers are much older than male female filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Um, it takes longer for women to get a foothold. It's taken us longer to see people, um, like us making films Mm -hmm. as directors. So a lot of people who have always wanted to do that, you know, when we were in college or not in college, or, you know, we were in 18, 19, 20 all the directors names that we had to look to were all men. So like, Mm -hmm. even if you think, and I feel like I at that age thought I could do anything. I thought I was like a, an empowered young woman and could do anything I wanted. And I really believed that I felt that way. But the truth is when you don't have representation, you really don't feel that way. You don't even acknowledge it. It's sort of like in the back of your head or like just sort of vaguely there. And so when all the names you're looking at, of the greatest directors still if you google greatest directors i mean even greta gerwig isn't showing up on any of those lists yet they're all men Mm -hmm. genius directors they're all men so Mm -hmm. you know it it a lot of like women in this industry are a little bit older because they were doing something else because we didn't have the the belief in the industry or the belief in ourselves or the belief in other women that it was a possibility to to have that kind of a career and so, you know, I think there's like some element of that that plays plays on all of my decisions that I didn't realize that was very subconscious. Um, and also, I think like I I have so much respect for young filmmakers because I just have so much respect for anything anybody young is saying ever. I did when I was yeah. I did when I was young, and I do now. <laughs> Like I always was like, these are the people we should be listening to. Oh my gosh, when I moved to working in architecture, okay, like I Mm -hmm. came into architecture as a biologist helping on this project in Rwanda. Um, And um, the other people who are my age who had gone to architecture school were paid less than me. Nobody would listen to them in meetings because they didn't know how to like stack a building properly, which is true. And I would witness that. And I'd be like, I don't understand why, but they had these like creative, amazing ideas that were Uh brand new that were maybe not very um, feasible and were going to be hard to accomplish and maybe weren't even possible because maybe you just can't build a building that way yet. Yeah. But I was like, those people, these like people who are my age, who you're not listening to are really cool. And I'm in this weird per, like position where you're listening to me because I'm bringing this other information to the table that's helpful. Mm-hmm. But like these people are my same age and studied this this in college. Like, right. they're so cool and smart. And like, yeah, maybe their stuff's like a little bonkers, but like, that's the future, man. Mm-hmm. And like, I feel that way about, so I've always felt that way. I'm like, God, just everybody shut up and listen to these these people who are young. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not young anymore. I'm not old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not old, but I'm not young but, anymore. <laughs> but I do really try to pay attention to what young filmmakers are doing and learn from that as much as I try to pay attention to really like well established and like you know critically acclaimed and um, old <laughs> filmmakers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's time for us to take a break. When we come back, I'll ask Tasha about what it was like to use filmmaking as a tool for activism. Then I'll have one quick thing before I go about which Exorcist movie you should be taking time to watch this Halloween season. So stick around for that at the end. I'm Dan McCoy. I'm Stuart Wellington. I'm Elliot Kalin. And together we are The Flophouse, a long-running podcast on the Maximum Fun Network, where we watch a bad movie and then talk about it. And because we're so long-running, maybe you haven't given us a chance. I get it. But you don't actually have to know anything about previous episodes to enjoy us. And I promise you that if you find our voices irritating, we grow endearing over time. Perhaps you listened to one of our old episodes and decided that we were dumb and immature. Well, we've been doing this a while now. We have become smarter and more mature and generally nicer to Dan. But we are only human, so no promises. Find the Flophouse on MaximumFun.org or wherever you get podcasts. Co-Optober continues in celebration of National Co-Op Month. I'm Kevin Ferguson, senior producer and worker owner at Maximum Fun. I'm Marissa Flaxbart, producer, and I'm also a worker owner at Max Fun. This week is all about community. Of course, we wouldn't be a co-op without the Max Fun community. And we love it whenever members of our audience get together. So 
We're having another Max Fun Meetup Day this Thursday, October 12th. And next week, we'll be hosting a panel discussion with other worker owners across the co op community. And we are still selling our limited edition Launch Crew merch available to all Max Fun members. But only through the end of the month. For more info on Meetup Day and everything Co Optober, head to maximumfun.org slash Co Optober. That's C O O P T O B E R. Have a great week. Welcome back to Feeling Seen. My co-host today is Natasha Hollaby, an actor and filmmaker who, last year, got the abortion rights horror anthology Give Me an A underway almost immediately after the Dobbs decision came down from the Supreme Court. And she's feeling seen by goth activist icon Wednesday Adams in today's conversation. Talk to me then about then, you know, the animating force behind Give Me an A. Mm. Which, I mean, coming out of, <laughs> a, you know, the the feverish travesty of the Dobbs decision and watching Roe v. Wade be obliterated last June, like, and putting together a very deliberate stack of, of women to direct the 17 shorts within Give Me an A. Like, when, it, tell me about, like, the sort of either... Disso- like dissociative break that you had to start this project or like the thunderclap of like your personal epiphany, <laughs> however you want to frame it. Yeah. Uh, I probably still have a lot of analyzing of that to do. <laughs> sure. Actually, like, actually, we could start there. Like, yeah. what have you learned about your your decision to make that movie a year ago? Like, at this point, having done press screenings and Q&As, like, what have you learned about your own choice to do this and your drive to do it through the course of having to examine it by being asked so much? That's a really cool way to look at it, Um, because I think it kind of relates back to what I was saying about, like, trusting yourself. Mm. Um, I was about to start making a movie that um, was going to be really exciting to make. Um... I liked it for lots of reasons, but Mm. it never felt 100% right. And I don't know that Mm. movie always does feel 100% right to make and getting funding for a movie is hard and they have to, you have to check a lot of boxes and our making movies isn't just an art. It's a, it's a commerce, you know? Yeah. um, I only bring that up because we weren't, we were just about to get going on, on some casting. We had already had a couple of casting calls. And it was just slow enough, long enough that Mm. it gave me a little bit of breathing room, I think, that happened to coincide with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, which, you know, we all knew it was coming, but for some reason, like it actually happening was just so devastating. (laughs) And the emotion that I felt, even though I, I knew it was coming, I don't know. I thought maybe somehow it'd be stopped, even though I was like, oh, people are protesting. Like, it's not going to stop it. You know, mm-hmm. I, that's that's already happened, basically. But like it actually happening was such an emotional hit. And it sort of just like put me I think it put my body into a state a little bit more of a state of like, just trust, trust yourself and all the rest of the stuff, mm-hmm. like make it it, it, it disappears. Mm-hmm. Wow, I'm saying this in such like a complicated way, but like <laughs> this is all sort of to get to like when that moment happened, the emotions, it was like a tunnel, you know, tunnel vision, like everything yeah. else that was like, if it wasn't at a hundred percent, so I'm kind of saying what I was working on, I wasn't a hundred percent on it. Right. I should really stop talking about it because we're still working on it. <laughs> um, but the emotion gave me tunnel vision to like only do what 100% is resonating with you, <laughs> mm-hmm. which was like being angry, feeling like sympathy and empathy for people I didn't know, for people I did know, Mm -hmm. um, feeling like everything I believed in our society about like freedom and rights was being like ripped away and like having to fight for that. And, and thinking about people being like harmed and me being in a position where I could do something and say something and knowing that I knew other women who could Mm -hmm. not just like by the fact that like, maybe they could take the time to do it, like physically have the time because they didn't have to maybe go to work every day and could take a couple of days off to do a film or that's like a privileged place to be, to be able to stop and tell a story. 
but also important that then you have to be doing it on behalf of other people who can't stop and do that, but also just the emotional capacity because Mm -hmm. we're all hit so hard. And it, it was like a, I think a real emotional ride for everybody and, (laughs) you know, making a movie is already an emotional ride. And then when you Mm -hmm. add onto it, the fact that you're making a movie because you are trying to use it to fight for your rights and other people's rights and to stop a slippery slope of, you know, once you start pulling rights away from women having bodily autonomy, then what's next? Um, and even in the Dobbs ruling, um, you know, Clarence Thomas tacked on, like, we're coming after contraception and same-sex marriage next. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just like this tunnel vision of, like, every nothing else matters. Like, if it's not, mm-hmm. at a, if it's not 100%, like, something you have to do right now, don't do it, slough it off. And like a hundred percent, like you have to fight for your rights. You have to fight for other people's rights. Mm-hmm. That's how I felt at the time. You know, now I recognize that the, that emotion is like really important and strong. And it's a part of what we've just done with the strike, this initial, like, oh, we have to fight. But just like the strike, there was like a marathon. Yeah. Met, having to like really go through a lot. A lot of people lost a lot during that time. And, mm-hmm. you know, same thing. We're in like a massive marathon for like getting bodily autonomy back. It's not, you know, it could change if. Yeah. I mean, it took it took the Republicans 40 years right, right. to strike down dogs. Yes. And I'm hoping it's not 40 years to make the gains against things we've lost and then go even further than we were before. But like that's these are generational fights. Yeah. Like it took generations to get us the Roe v. Wade decision. And, you know, it's dis comforting to look down and see such a long barrel pointed at you but it's like what choice have you got yeah yeah that's kind of it's hard you know we have so many things going on in the world in the united states we have so much information there's so many battles you know and you have to like you know pick and choose your battles but also like just because you want to you know be active be activated, mm-hmm. be an activist, um, doesn't mean you have to be an activist every breathing moment. You don't have to be angry and mad and fighting all the time. You can laugh mm-hmm. and be happy and take care of yourself and know your morals and ethics. And, you know, when you need to, and have the capacity to, you can stand up. And when you need to take care of yourself, you have to do that too. And the people mm-hmm. around you and all that, you know, so I do think um, that's really important to know too, because a lot of the people that worked on this film, they gave up so much to do this. They were all activated. They were all activists yeah. in doing this work, but that doesn't mean that they have to live and breathe, like, you know, posting and fighting and about abortion rights all the time. Like they already made their statement and mm-hmm. they'll continue to when they, when they want to, but like they've made their statement. You can push play now on a lot of different places and you can hear what all those filmmakers have to say and what their statement is about um, Roe v. Wade being overturned. And um, that's already a huge thing that they've given all of us, you know, all those filmmakers, all those directors, all the actors, um, everyone who worked on the project, you know, like you can just push the button now and their activism is present. It's a thing I certainly have registered for a long time, but it like when you make something and it gets to come out and like you said, you get to push play on it and other people can kind of, all over the world, it it really hits you how the stuff you make lives forever, maybe? And, like, you know, we can be sitting here talking about Wednesday Adams from, like, a movie back in, like, 1991, 1992, and, like, what that meant and continues to mean, and, and how that character now has been brought back to life in series form by a different actress, giving new life to that character for new generations of people in a different format on streaming television. Like, it is insane like you know you can't live in your head about all of the things that the implications of your art but like when you sit and relax on it like making something that sticks around forever is a pretty fucking insane privilege yeah truly it truly is and then sometimes when you're like oh it's so expensive to make a movie when you say what you just said you're like oh well, I guess it should I guess I guess it is <laughs> that's a joy like whoa when you when you put that when you attach that to it uh, yeah, you hope when you pay a lot for a really nice, like, jacket that you're paying a lot for something that becomes, like, a piece yes, that you yes. can, like, maybe pass down or something like yes. that. Like, you have a cat, you take care of a cast iron pan because it lasts forever kind of thing. Like, well, this is expensive because I mean for it to last, yes, to last forever. Yes, totally. 
Um, also, I like you bringing it back to Wednesday because I mean, like if I didn't just copy what she did when she put on that play, <laughs> then I don't know what I did. <laughs> I've been on to that for a long time. I'm like, oh, she used theater. <laughs> important related to history and politics, um, which is exactly what we did with Give Me an A. Well, I want to hear about why this is fun for you, too. Like, and, and you, you've you drawn toward genre stuff in your filmmaking, like stuff you've developed, stuff literally that you have made that has come out. So, like, what is the fun of that for you to work in that space? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> So many things. I mean, genre is the best. Um, it's such like a cool space to be able to talk about kind of anything mm. because you're talking about it with like metaphors and analogies and monsters. And so you can talk about the things that you maybe don't want to talk about straightforward. Uh, mm. You can get into like the emotions of what those things are without having to keep it all facts, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, you can like connect with people in like a really visceral way because even all different types of like horror genre, like it, it connects with you in a really visceral way because I mean, obviously being scared is like, a a key part of horror, but mm -hmm. the way the scare happens can be so many different ways. And like, we're humans, like we're basically like fight or flight like we are yeah yeah we survive because of fear like we literally fear is like a thing that keeps us alive you know mm -hmm. if you're afraid on the side of a cliff when people are like oh i'm afraid of heights like how are you a climber i'm like i am also afraid of heights it is what has kept me alive as a climber because i'm mm -hmm. afraid like respectfully and sometimes it's overwhelming and i have to overcome that fear like i mean there are i've been climbing for over 20 years. And sometimes I'm in a position where if I look down or the wind blows a certain way and something moves and I'm like kind of thrown off, I have to like pull my <sighs> shit together. Like you put me on a Ferris wheel and I'm screaming at the top of the Ferris wheel. Like I have a healthy <laughs> fear of heights <laughs> and that's good. So like, I think that's the kind of key thing about like horror that people are like, oh, it makes you afraid. And like, why do you want to be afraid? And it's like, cause that's like kind of a key component to living it's like so visceral and it's so like tied to how we survive and when you can tap into that be it psychological or like something like really visual or something like scary and unusual to see or whatever like it's activates something really special inside a human where you connect at like a whole deeper level and so i think genre is like such a cool space to work in it's so much more than just like a scary movie Poor Debbie. She was sick. She wasn't sick. She was sloppy. What do you mean? If I wanted to kill my husband, I'd do it. And I wouldn't get caught. How? I'd scare him to death. Well, like, so I guess my, my, my final question to you would be then, like, to the, to the point at the beginning of, like, you, like, getting kind of ragged on for your pigtails and then you leaning into it and, and, like, answering the, the Adam's jingle with the snaps, with several careers behind you and then this career being, I feel like, a, a sort of unique test of one's endurance, what have you found, you know, as you've grown up in this career, what uniqueness of you has has this industry fortified? Like, what's the Tasha thing that has had to just be forged to, like a fucking sword to, like, get you through this that you have realized through through filmmaking? I think a lot of things came to mind, but I think probably the most important thing um, that's also, like, something that can be passed on and somebody else could take is um, focus. Mm. So, like, when you rock climb, which I, you know, mentioned I've been doing for over 20 years, you when you're when you lead a climb you're basically bringing the rope up and you're placing gear that then the second will remove um and you're you're above the rope sometimes so when you're above the rope and you're above a piece of gear the rope can fall and you would fall pretty pretty far and it, it that's where the sort of danger most of the danger lies um mm -hmm. also other circumstances like weather wind the rock being weak there are lots of outside forces as well but um you know, all those things together, like while you're climbing, when you're in a moment, you have all these little, little surfaces and little cracks, and you're looking for all of them. And if you look down and you see 
how far you came from, you know, it can get scary. And if you look way up to where you have to go, it can be really scary. Mm. Um, at the same time, you have to look down and kind of have an awareness of where your last piece of gear is. So you're keeping safe and you have to look ahead. So, you know, where the next place is you can put gear yeah. and around, you know, what direction looks the best to go. So you have to have all this awareness of everything, but when you make a move, in that moment, you are really focused on exactly where you are. Everything else goes away. Nothing else, no like life shit is coming uh-huh. up. Like you're not like worried about like the last like fight you had with with like your mom or like who said what about like your shoes? Yeah. Know. Nobody cares what anybody said about anybody's shoes. That's a bad example. But <laughs> you know, like none of it, nothing matters except for you being in that exact moment and taking the next step Mm. and doing it safely and doing it well and doing Mm -hmm. it right and doing your best at that exact next move with your hand at that exact next move with your foot and Uh putting pressure on it and trusting it. And so like those moments of climbing and I have other things in my life that are, are, I think, really similar to that. Like that focus is so important in filmmaking because making a film is huge. It's overwhelming. There are so many moving parts. Yeah. But you have to do it well. You have to do it safely. You have to stay focused. You have to just have like some tr- trust in like what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And same with rock climbing. If you start going one direction, I mean, you can come back down. You have choices, so you can come back down, but it's going to be a lot harder, probably. So you got to be real clear on what choices you're making when you're making them, yeah. and just proceed forward. You know, so I yeah. think that's probably the thing that is most valuable. Um, and it's not even necessarily, you know, it's not really unique, and it's something everybody can have. Like if you mm-hmm. can remember to stay, you know, focused in each moment in anything we do in life, it's going to be real helpful. <laughs> no, I think, it, and with the, you know, because movies aren't just a director and they're not just a star, they are a billion people and a billion hours and contract negotiations while you're making editing decisions sometimes, <laughs> just yeah. like every everything stacking up all at once. I think that is an outstanding metaphor for a very vital, I think a very vital trait that I don't actually know that I hear people talk about necessarily all that much specifically like just the importance of focus because focus too is like don't get distracted and like don't let like the way you can so many things are begging to pull your focus when something is like in that development churn kind of situation so I think that is a perfect note to go out on and I so appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today Tasha I so appreciate you and all the cool things you're doing and um thank you so so much for hanging out yeah and now there can be two of us on here telling everybody to go watch give me an a which is now on tubi correct it's on tubi you can get it on amazon on apple tv on what are some of the other ones google play yeah you can stop listening and go hit play (laughs) that's right go hit play on our immortal art yes (laughs) we are immortal thank you tasha Thank you so much to executive producer, director, writer, friend, Natasha Holovy. As we mentioned, and not for the first time on this show, Give Me an A is streaming for free on Tubi. Don't log in. Don't sign up. Just go to the website and search Give Me an A, and you can watch it right now. Uh, You can also rent it and buy it. So if you want to monetarily hook it up, you are more than welcome. But if you just want to watch it, please just go watch it on Tubi. Um, And if you want to catch up with the Addams Family movies, they are currently on Paramount Plus. And boy, do they hold up. What a wonderful time. And now that one quick thing before I go, I mentioned uh, the Exorcist movie you should be watching this Halloween. Believer? Nah. Talked about it on Pop Culture Happy Hour. This is the first time in like a couple years or a year plus of appearances on that show that I haven't actually gone to bat for the thing that I was on the show, on the program to talk about. It's whatever. The performances are really good. Those little girls, they're doing a great job. Um, the parts are good. There, there are many parts of it are, that are, that are quality. Uh, the whole is like, meh. Uh, but you know what? Like, obviously you go watch the exorcist. That's a classic. 
But if there is an Exorcist movie that I would recommend you chase down this uh, this October, it's Exorcist 3. It's Exorcist 3. Brad Dourif is giving you everything. Like, and Brad Dourif always does. Like, we can always count on Brad Dourif, the voice of Chucky, uh, to go over the top and, like, only way out is through on every occasion. Love Brad Dourif. And he is really the center of Exorcist 3. This is not a supporting Brad Dourif role. This is main character Brad Dourif. And Exorcist 3 is about, I'll give you a little summary here, uh, courtesy of Rotten Tomatoes, Police Lieutenant Kinderman George C. Scott notices similarities between his current murder investigation and the methods used by the Gemini killer, Brad Dourif, who was executed 15 years before. He soon discovers a hospitalized mental patient, Jason Miller, claiming to be the dead serial killer, but who looks uncannily like a priest Kinderman knew who died during an exorcism. As more bodies are found, Kinderman looks for connections between the two supposedly dead men. So, and it's, it's very talky. It, it's like a, it's at many points like a two-hander between George C. Scott and Brad Dourif in a, a cell, in a, in a, a, a mental institution. And it's just, it's so worth it for the talky back and forth that you kind of wouldn't associate necessarily with an exorcism movie. Because it's got Brad Dourif in it. It's got Brad Dourif in it channeling serial killer. As we know, um, serial killer, something he does very well. Shouts out to Chucky, the best of the super serial killers. Um, oh, yeah. Producer Marissa letting me know that Patrick Ewing plays the angel of death in this movie. Nick's legend Patrick Ewing is in this film. And it does have, does have one of the great jump scares of all time. It has a canonical jump scare thrown into it. It's 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 like how in Halloween 3 season of The Witch, you get kind of what the Halloween franchise was meant to be originally, if it was going to exist as a franchise, which was something anthologized, where you take the conceit of like, Halloween, ooh, and then like each movie does something different than the last. It's not necessarily like a Michael Myers story. And you have like the tale of a uh, demonic capitalism infecting the youth of America and and killing them and, and causing death and murders. Um, that's a cool... The season of the Witch is cool because it is so different from the Michael Myers story. Uh, Exorcist 3 is cool because it almost, in its way, I feel like has that almost anthologized feel to the Exorcist where it's like, hey guys, this is scary. Let's just like twist it up a little bit and take it somewhere else in the way that like I, I appreciate that about kind of um, the later later stages of the Jason movies the my, my least favorite super killer franchise but like Jason takes Manhattan Jason takes a boat you guys Manhattan's barely in that movie but like Jason takes Manhattan um, Jason goes to hell and Jason X Jason goes to space are honestly my three favorite Friday the 13th movies because they just all feel, they all, like they have Jason in them, but they feel so dissociated from a slasher franchise that starts at a summer camp that it starts, that it feels interesting to me again. It feels fun. It's like, let's take this thing that works at its root and let's gonna blow it out and go crazy with it. And I think that's what Exorcist 3 to me feels like in terms of the Exorcist conversation, which at this point is a long conversation with a lot of dull moments in it, including Believer that just came out. But yeah. This is a pro, uh, this is not an anti-anything else conversation. This is a pro Exorcist 3 conversation. So that is my recommendation for one quick thing. And that is our show. You can follow us on Twitter at Pod or send us an email at feelingscene at maximumfun.org. If you want to follow me, I'm Jor Crew on Twitter. Our theme music is by Andrew Epen. The show is produced by Marissa Flaxbart. Our senior producers are Kevin Ferguson and Laura Swisher. And this is a production of Maximum Fun. Maximum Fun, a worker-owned network of artist-owned shows. Supported directly by you.